This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Now we're going to look at change and change management. All organisations go through change. Sometimes it's imposed from the environment. Perhaps it's a competitor action. Perhaps it's a change in the economy. The economy goes down. You have to change by maybe closing down certain outlets and so on. Technology changes, so you have to make more use of the internet. Uh, anything of, of that type is externally imposed on you. Uh, sometimes the push for the change comes uh, from internal mechanisms uh, that you decide that the current management structure isn't working very well, it is too slow to communicate, it is too, too, too slow to respond to what customers want, uh, and you change from a tall, narrow structure to a wide, flat structure. Uh, so many changes are also internally provoked. The uh, process uh, uh, goes usually through, uh, the change process goes through a, a life cycle, uh, typically like, like this uh, here. Uh, uh, change shouldn't just be entered into without knowing where you're ending up at. That is the wrong way to do change. Uh, it needs to be planned. It's not something you, you, you kind of just wander into informally. So what we need to do is to have particular goals. We need to, to plan what we want to happen, what we want the outcome to be. So uh, if the change is being imposed from outside uh, because the economy's taken a dive, we have to save a certain amount of money. We will be planning you know, how much money we're going to be saving uh, and so on uh, to uh, survive. And then uh, that's where we want to end up, certain savings, maybe if it's internally dealing with customers better, more quickly, more flexibly, whatever it's going to be. Uh, and ideally, uh, you would uh, have some ways of measuring that, because if you don't measure the result of the change, you're never quite sure whether you've, you've got there or not. You'd analyze the existing activities. Uh, you analyze existing activities to see which ones maybe could be improved, which ones could be scrapped entirely and, and so on. We have to understand what we have uh, before we begin meddling with it. You design a new or improved process. So we might analyze, if we're thinking of closing down some of our operations, we might be analyzing where the warehouses are at the moment. Uh, we'll be analyzing well, where are the customers at the moment. And we'll say, well, with a warehouse down there, very few customers around there. Maybe we could serve those customers from a, a, another warehouse. Uh, and therefore, what we're doing is designing this new uh, process. Uh, or maybe you could say, right, uh, so we can have instant access for customers down there. Maybe what we'll do is we'll uh, open up a much smaller warehouse rather than closing it down entirely. So we'll be looking at alternatives to try and choose the best answer, the best result, which is going to be coming out. We develop uh, the new processes or the uh, the new systems. You might redesign products, you redesign the management structure, uh, you would redesign maybe some of the IT and so on. Uh, and, and also, as I say, we need to, to measure in some way how our progress can be uh, monitored. We do the implementation, the transition. This can be a, a painful and difficult time. Uh, maybe some employees are made redundant. Uh, people are, are in any way a little bit disorientated. They may be learning new skills, new IT system, new ways of liaising with clients and so on. So it's always a little bit uncomfortable, the actual change process. Even if everyone agrees that the objective we're getting to, the goal we're getting to, is actually worthwhile. It's, it's tough whilst you're in the middle of it. And then you review the success of the new uh, process and, if necessary, uh, refine it again uh, or leave it a couple of years and have another look at it and so on. So like many of these things, uh, you never do it once and forget about it. Uh, very often it's, it's part of a, a cycle which is repeated. Now one uh, model which people uh, talk about when uh, looking at what maybe needs to be considered on any change is something called the Poppet model, uh, which says that the following really are up for change, so to speak. Uh, the people. 
What sort of people do you employ? How many? What skills do they have? How should we reward them? What sort of culture do we need? These are all very... How do we motivate them? What sort of bonuses? These are all very, very fundamental to the success of an organisation. There is the, uh, the the shape of the organisation, tall, narrow, wide, flat, we've mentioned. Maybe we should move to a, a kind of matrix. Uh, maybe we should divisionalize. Uh, again, there are, there are many... Uh, uh, maybe we should uh, combine two accounting departments in different divisions into one division. There are many organisational uh, improvements uh, which could potentially be made. Uh, the processes. How do we actually carry out the processes? Maybe at the moment we do them all in-house. Maybe we, we handle the delivery of goods in-house. Uh, and maybe what we should be thinking of, maybe should we outsource some of that? Outsource delivery to a logistics company? Uh, should we move from having lots of inventory to just in time? Uh, should we buy in completely raw material? Should we buy in it uh, you know, partly made uh, so that we do a little bit less with it and, and, and so on? So we have to understand the value chain. We have to make sure that any change we put through uh, doesn't hurt what our customers think about us. Uh, so we really must understand what's important to them about what we do and be very cautious indeed about putting through changes which might uh, distract, if you like, uh, from what the customers value. And finally, there's IT. Uh, IT uh, is, is terribly important in uh, most organisations now nowadays. We should be thinking of its architecture, what sort of networks should we be having, should be centralised, decentralised, uh, should we be making use of cloud technology and so on. Uh, do we need new software? Should we write it ourselves? Should we subcontract the writing of it and so on? We'll see much more about this in, the, in, a, in a later chapter. But Poppet is a good little checklist. Uh, consider the people, the organisation, the processes and the IT all fair game uh, for a potentially radical change. A couple of uh, specific things we need to, to look at here. Uh, when we're looking at people, we talked about cultural web. Uh, and the culture of an organisation can be defined as the way you do things around there. And we're all very sensitive to organisational culture. We're sensitive to it when we um, join a new job or when we join university and so on. We kind of go carefully for a little while, uh, really to see how people do things around there. We don't want to ruffle feathers. We want to fit in very much. So we're always sensitive to culture. It doesn't mean you like it, but we know it exists. So these are the, the sorts of uh, uh, influences on corporate culture. First of all, we have the symbols and titles. Does your boss like to be called Mr. X or Mrs. Y? Or is it first name terms? Uh, are they given a great big office all to themselves kind of thing, or do they rather sit uh, sit amongst the rest of the workforce? Uh, do they have a symbol of a very flashy company car and uh, so on? This alters the tone of the business. And, and in an organisation where maybe innovation is important, where it's fast moving, where it's a new technology, uh, having to call your boss Mr X or Mrs Y may actually be a, a, an a inhibiting factor on communication. Uh, and it could be the, the new young employees who are up to date on what the company needs to do. Power relations. Uh, does your boss tell you what to do and there's no argument? Or is it more the sort of boss who says, uh, uh, what do you think about this? Do you think we should? Or what are your ideas on how to improve that? Whether it's a very kind of dictatorial situation or much more participative sort of management. Organisational structure. The old organisational structures were tall, narrow. Uh, lots and lots of layers. Uh, any manager or supervisor only looking after a couple of people. Very, very strict reporting uh, 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 pathways and so on there. Uh, the people at the top were a long way removed from the people at the bottom. By and large, many organisations have tried to get rid of that. It was uh, slow and expensive uh, and really rather obstructive to change. And it moved to a, a wider, flatter type of structure, much more 
egalitarian, maybe only three layers in the organization. Uh, and they find this is uh, much faster to react to environmental or market changes. Control systems. Well, if your uh, generic strategy was one of a cost leader, you're probably going to have very fierce control over costs. Uh, you'd be looking at all the kind of uh, you know, expense claim forms and be very kind of strict with that. You'd probably be clocking people out, out and into the factory only paying them for the hours worked and so on there because you live or die by low costs, really. In a an organisation whose generic strategy is more differentiation, then your success really is more on pleasing the customer and probably you don't watch the costs as much. You don't, you don't mind if the costs go up a little bit, provided the customer is pleased and is willing to pay a good price. You're still, you're still winning in, in that. Rituals and routines. Uh, rituals and routines kind of uh, grow very often uh, unexpectedly. Uh, and you're kind of expected to fall in with that. They can be almost trivial. Like uh, on your birthday, do you have to bring in a cake or, or biscuits or something of that sort? In a way, it's trivial if you don't, but, but uh, people are going to look at you a little bit oddly. Uh, and you may not be enjoying quite the same informal communication uh, as you might with someone who, who joins full-heartedly into that culture. Myths and stories. These are often events which are kind of elevated into the, the kind of category of a, of a myth, often deliberately uh, to educate people on how they're supposed to behave in certain circumstances. So you could imagine maybe a, a consultancy company uh, and they say, well, I can remember on Friday night, Friday evening, we got this job coming in from a client. Uh, they were thinking of a takeover. They needed due diligence being done by kind of Monday afternoon. We only therefore had the weekend really to, to do the work. And we all pulled together. We all stayed in the office all weekend. We slept there. We brought in pizza uh, uh, and so on. But uh, we, we, we worked kind of 22 hours a day and so on. But my goodness me, we got that report out on time. Uh, and this and this kind of event, as I say, would be kind of entered into the mythology of the firm and be trotted out, particularly to new recruits, as a, as a kind of lesson. That, you know, we always make deadlines. We go to any length whatsoever uh, to make sure we hit client deadlines. And then there's a, an organisational assumption, the, the, the paradigm, as it's sometimes called. This is the hardest one very often to grasp. Uh, it is... Uh, Always getting back to the mission. Why do you think the organization is there? What do you think its function is? Uh, and maybe the best example I could give is, is kind of based on the, the, our national health service in the UK. And it might be simplifying slightly, but kind of 50 years ago, uh, medical treatments were much simpler uh, than they are now. There's much less you could actually do for people and drugs were simpler and cheaper. Uh, and very much the, the kind of organisational assumption then was that anyone who comes who needing medical help, they can get all the medical help that we can give them. Uh, because we're, and by, anyway, money was no object. Money wasn't very important. Uh, and doctors never thought about the costs of treatment. Uh, now things are different uh, a bit. The, Types of treatment which you can have are much more sophisticated than types of drugs, much more expensive. The population is in general aging. There's much more financial pressure on the National Health Service. And now it isn't quite the same. It isn't quite anyone can have any of treatment, any treatment that's required. And it doesn't matter about the cost. Now, uh, hospital managers, doctors have to look at the cost. They say, you know, we've got this amount of money. What is the best way to spend it? Uh, and so the organizational assumption has changed a little bit uh, back to or, or towards one where, where, where money is more important than it used to be uh, uh, and we have to be careful about how we use these resources that are not endless. The next uh, uh, item we need to look at is the McKinsey 7S model uh, and again, you can be thinking that when we're changing an organization, uh, maybe uh, some attention needs to be given to these seven S's. Uh, 
and they are as follows. Uh, and some of them overlap with maybe what we've seen already uh, in the cultural web. So there's a structure of the company. We need to get that right. We need to think about the systems, the IT systems, the quality control systems, uh, the, 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 the kind of systems which look after the health and safety of people. We need to get that right. Style is style of management. Staff, I don't know if you can see it there, but this one at the bottom says staff. Uh, staff is really uh, saying that we have to make sure we have the right staff with the right training and the right attitude and the right number of them and so on. That they have to have the right skills. Uh, that the company has to have a strategy which is suitable for success in the current environment. Uh, the ones at the top, the blue ones here, are sometimes called the hard S's because these are the ones which are supposed to be more easily written down. The ones at the bottom here are sometimes called the soft S's. These are supposed to be the ones which are, 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 are more difficult to capture. You know, the, the, the style of management, the style of the company uh, and so on. And then we have the shared values in the middle, uh, which for all intents and purposes is the same as we had in the previous slide the organizational assumptions or the paradigm. It's kind of what everyone shares. It's what the organization is for, what we should do, how we should react in circum certain circumstances. Uh, and when we're changing, we should be thinking of giving attention to making sure each of these seven S's is appropriate to the organization that we're trying to head towards. You can categorize the extent of change by looking at its scope and its nature. Now, the nature of change is basically whether something is incremental and gradual or whether it's Big Bang. The scope of change is two ways of looking at it. How much of the organization is being changed? Is it all or just one department? But also kind of how fundamentally it is being changed. Are we changing from being a cost leader to a differentiator, for example, which is a very kind of radical change? And they're given these, these um, words in here. So the scope of change is relatively small. You're talking a little bit just a little realignment. If the scope of change is big, changing all of the organization or radical change from cost leadership up to differentiation, then it's really our transforming the organization. And I think of this as primarily uh, setting out the risk that's associated with change, because change has got big risks. Maybe the new system doesn't work. Maybe your stakeholders don't like it. Maybe your employees leave because they're so disgruntled with the new system. Uh, and, and where you have the biggest risk is obviously down here. And I think we know what a revolution is. A political revolution happens quickly uh, and effectively it changes a whole country. It might work, but of course there are great dangers from revolutions that they don't work. They don't produce anything which is any better. Uh, and a lot of revolutions, of course, end up in a kind of a civil war, uh, which in a, in a company would, would obviously not be, it wouldn't be shooting each other, but it would obviously be people's at each other's throats and lack of cooperation uh, and maybe customers abandoning you. So that's very high risk. These ones here, incremental, slow, gradual changes. Uh, the way I remember adaptation, evolution, is I think of bi biological terms. We talk about animals adapting maybe to uh, a different climate. Uh, but the idea is it's a small change happening relatively slow. It's still the same animal. Or we can talk, or uh, biologists talk about evolution, where they say a very radically different creature emerges here slowly. So uh, a big change from cost leadership to differentiation is definitely a very different company which is coming out. But again, it's slow. So both adaptation and evolution are slow. And the great thing about uh, a change being slow is if it's going wrong, you can stop it. Uh, and you may spot it's going, going wrong before too much damage is done. And you might be able to reverse those changes. Obviously, there's slightly more risk with evolution. 
If you're trying to change the whole business, maybe every stakeholder is going to be affected. More damage is possible, but at least you can stop it. If you're just changing one department, you, you know, any damage which is being done is going to be kind of confined to that department and is even less risk. And finally, then we have reconstruction. Uh, it, it's a, a small change, it ha relatively small change, it has to happen quickly. So what it might be, an example of reconstruction, is deciding to outsource your delivery to a logistics company. So most stakeholders are not going to be affected uh, by that. Uh, it's, it's relatively isolated in what it's doing, but it's going to be a quick change. So you kind of sack your delivery drivers on a Friday, you go to DHL or one of the other logistics company on a Monday uh, there. It, it could go wrong. Uh, but uh, because it is small, it is easier to control. Uh, you can explain to people what's happening much better and so on. And if it did go wrong, uh, then, you know, the damage is limited. It's not great, but the damage is limited. So there's, there's only kind of moderate risk there. Change management. So what we're dealing with here is really the, the sorts of change and, and what, be what needs to be changed. Here we're dealing now with how to change it. Uh, and there are a number of models. Uh, and the big complicated one is one called Balagon and Hope Haley. And they talked about the kaleidoscope of change. And it looks very complicated. Uh, but what we have around this, this outer circle here, this is what they call the contextual features of change. Okay, And in the middle, what we have is design choices. So think of these here as the variables. And think of these as how we react, how we actually put through the changes, the change management, if you like. So what I've done on the next slide is I've just written the contextual features of change, the variables, in a kind of linear uh, list here. So uh, some changes are urgent, uh, but some are more relaxed. So an example of an urgent change would be, you notice you're running out of cash, you go up towards your overdraft limit, there is going to be an urgent change, like do not spend any more money on capital expenditure. Do not recruit any more people. Suspend the building of that factory because we can't afford it. Now, if it's an urgent change, uh, and we'll see some of, the, some of the, uh, the, the methods we could adopt, some of the design choices uh, uh, here, I would suggest that if we look at these design choices, an urgent chain has to be done quickly. You can't start discussing it with people. The, the management style you would adopt here would be a very authoritative one. You would say stop. Because if you try to have a participative management style, let's all agree on what the change would be, you'd have busted your overdraft limit. You haven't got the luxury of time. It, it may well be top down. It's probably coming from management saying stop as a kind of emergency. If it's a less uh, uh, urgent change, you know, next year we're thinking maybe of re reorganizing or the, the, the structure of the organization and so on there, then we might want to hear what people's views are. It might be interesting to, to hear from people further down the organization what, what, what problems they have maybe with communicating with people further up. Scope. If most of the organization is affected, you're probably going to need help. Uh, it would probably be wise, if you were a manager, uh, to, to, to adopt a, a fairly participative management style. Because if you try to change all departments just by your own thought process as a manager, uh, you're going to be very lucky indeed if you get them all right. Uh, you, you may need to, to, to plan it more carefully. The time scale is likely to be longer if you're going to be changing the whole organization because everything needs to be kind of lined up together. Whereas if there's just a small part of the organization to be changed, you might be able to decide on that yourself and do it pretty quickly. Preservation. You need to think uh, what parts of the organization do we want to keep as they are. We don't want to change an organization so that our best staff members leave. Uh, or, or, or the people uh, uh, get so fed up they become unhelpful and unfriendly with the customers and so on. 
Uh, and uh, what we need to do maybe is, is, is maybe to, to explain to people uh, we need, again, maybe our participative management style so we don't impose too much on people against their will, uh, otherwise they could react badly. Do we have the capabilities? In other words, do we have the skills to do the change in-house? Because the change process is really quite specialised. It, for example, needs a lot of training. and uh, Maybe we don't have people on the staff who can do training. Maybe we have to get people in from outside. So we'll be looking there, uh, I suppose, to change consultants. Who are we going to get to do it? Capacity. How much money, time, how much uh, human resources can we give to this? Uh, <clears throat> if, if time is short, if money is short, then maybe not too much participation. If money is short, then maybe we don't, uh, can't afford to have the consultants coming in and so on. Readiness to change is a very important variable. The assumption often is that people are going to be resisting change. Uh, uh, and if they resist change, then you need to get them on side. You need to try to overcome that resistance. So things like education and communication is going to be important. Uh, getting a consultant in who, is, who knows that people will be frightened about change. Uh, getting uh, uh, people uh, to contribute the management style, which is more participative so they don't feel they're just being imposed upon uh, will maybe reduce the resistance to change and make people more ready. And finally you have power. If you're the owner manager of the company then to some extent you have absolute power uh, and people are probably less likely to argue about the change. In other organizations if you're a manager kind of further down you have to be careful that people don't object to the change you're making and actually kind of leapfrog you and actually undermine what's happening there. So, so power in the last resort, or edict if you like, uh, is, is a contextual feature. So what they say was, depending on these variables, you can then make these design choices. How long should the change be? What outcomes should we be aiming for? Who should start it? What management style should we adopt? Uh, what are the roles of education, communication, participation, uh, uh, getting people on weekends away to get these cultural interventions and so on going on so they, they realise they're part of a team. Another form of change uh, management is Lewin's force field. Uh, Lewin said uh, we have got forces for change, typically management, maybe wanting to uh, change productivity agreements, change working arrangements, change organisational structure. And the chances are that people resist change. They're frightened they'll lose their job, they're frightened they're going to have a worse job, they're going to be broken apart from colleagues, uh, 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 and so on. Uh, and if they're uh, highly organised, maybe by a militant trade union, then these forces resisting change can be really quite powerful. And what you don't want is for the forces of change to go one way and the forces resisting your change kind of going the other way really kind of powerfully uh, and kind of locking horns uh, uh, and getting entrenched positions and so on uh, and then they, they feel they can't reverse those conditions and the whole thing kind of escalates. You've got this kind of macho power struggle going on to see who wins. Lewin said what you should do instead of going head to head is to aim to weaken resistance. And the way you do this is by uh, uh, education. Tell people why the change is needed. Communicate. Tell people what the changes are going to be because people often fear the worst. They fear there's going to be redundancies and maybe you've no thought of redundancies. So communicate again why it's necessary. Uh, participation is very good. So after you've explained to people what the problem is, uh, ask them for their solutions. What do you think we should do because we're losing market share? And the great thing is that, that once somebody makes a suggestion, it's very difficult for them later on to resist that suggestion. Uh, and, and, and again, the participation is very good for, for communication, understanding, uh, and, and, and so on. Uh, and the final one I would put here is to envision the future.
you can say to people, look, we're going to have a rough couple of months. Uh, we're going to have to make some people redundant. You are going to be losing friends. You're going to have to work hard as you learn the new IT system. Uh, but after a couple of months go past, we are confident uh, that this new IT system will allow you to do your job better. We are confident that there'll be no more redundancies required and that the company has a secure future. So you're trying to say, here's the promised land, you know. We have to get through this tough few months. But look at look at the goal, look at the prize which is there. Uh, and this can, again, be used to try to overcome resistance. Uh, Lewin also talked about uh, change management in his three-step process. On-freeze uh, is really loosening people up. Uh, telling people, change is coming, here's why it's coming, here's why it's necessary. Uh, you put through the changes, and that, that could take you know a couple of months, training, getting to use a new system, and then you refreeze. And refreeze has got two elements to it. Uh, first of all, if, if the change you're putting through was better customer service and you were teaching people you know, to be polite on the phone, you don't want them to kind of slip back into their old, rude, abrupt ways. So you have to refreeze them. But also, if refreezing an element of settling down, We've been through a tough time on the transition here. You need to let things settle down so that people actually begin to see the benefit of the new system, actually begin to enjoy the new system. If you are in a perpetual state of change, this settling down never happens. People never really get to learn and understand and enjoy the benefit from the change. Uh, styles of management that can be adopted uh, to, to try and push through changes. They're not all mutually exclusive at all, uh, but education and communication we've talked about. Collaboration and participation we've talked about. Very good ways of educating people or, or getting people to understand why the change is needed and what the changes are going to be. You can have intervention. The change agent, the person in charge of the change, uh, can uh, delegate change to people but keeps ultimate control it's not complete delegation or complete abrogation of responsibility there it can be more pointed uh, you can kind of tell people control more carefully what they have to do that is direction uh, and finally you can give very very explicit uh, orders to people uh, as to how to change so, so direction is kind of saying, I think it would be a good idea. Uh, coercion edict is, is kind of saying, you will do this. There's a, a, a kind of difference in, 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 in the degree of direction which is given there. Uh, this may have to happen in some cases if something is very, very urgent there. Or maybe if you're that despite all of these other interventions, you know, they all fail, people are still resisting change, you might say, well, do it, or find another job is a kind of, kind of ultimate uh, sanction which managers have.